to go in more more depth as far as um, this convex optimization. Um, there's a very good source on the website, on, on the um, Stanford website, Professor Boyd. Um, there's actually two courses. I mean, they're on the quarter system, but they have two quarters um, talking about convex optimization, one and two. And they're actually the videos, so they do the same type of stuff. Um, and they're, <clears throat> you can watch uh, well, two semester worth of convex optimization uh, with lots of applications. I mean, the this is an electrical engineering course, so you ma many of the applications are kind of good for uh, electrical engineers. But so. Um, And it comes actually with a book, so it's a whole book just on convex optimization. Um, <clears throat> lots of MATLAB files, so it is it is a more advanced um, or more in depth. Um, treatment. What we're going to be doing is. Um, Today we're going to be, you know, finishing this uh, chapter sort of by talking about um, the conjugate gradient method. And it's a beautiful method, um, as you'll see. So it comes as a good time after the midterm. You can kind of relax and um, enjoy. Um, so I have a code here, but, you know, as always, if somebody just gives you the algorithm in its implementation and just asks you to to solve it, I mean to to run it, it's like you have no clue what's behind it, right? So, um, so let me try to give you sort of a of a um, You know, of an introduction behind the scenes of this gradient, what what happens in this gra uh, conjugate gradient method. But keep in mind that we're still trying to solve linear system of linear equations. And um, what we said, well, you've seen that already. That. Um, Using optimization of the functional, um, let's see, g of x. I'm going to try to stick with the notation in the book so it's easier to follow. But one half x transpose a x minus, and here's there's there, there's actually quite a few typos here. So. Um, there's a B transpose times X. I'm going to, well, as usual, X is going to be a column. B is going to be a column, right? And so when we write this quadratic form of the quadratic like this, or, or which is the same X transpose B, which you've seen before, right? So it's, this is. Um, we know why optimizing, or in, in which case is minimizing, so no, no constraint, right? So it's a convex function. Well, okay. We have to say what um, the assumptions are why A is symmetric. So it's, it's a square metric, symmetric, and positive definite. Okay, then this this functional function is is a uh, convex, and the uh, minimum occurs where the gradient is zero, and the gradient is is exactly the gradient is exactly a x minus b. If you write it as a column, right? So where the gradient equal to zero, that's where you have solutions to that equation. Of course. When A is symmetric and positive definite, we know what? We know that A is actually invertible. Why? Well, if A is symmetric and positive definite, it means all the eigenvalues are positive. There is no zero eigenvalue. So 
the inverse exists in principle, right? But of course, to compute it, it it's a it's it's a it's a complicated matter. Um, computationally, it's, it's uh, expensive. But in any event, the that's the optimal that we will get. Okay. The question is, how can you get to the optimal through uh, like iterative or through an algorithmic approach or search, starting with some initial condition? Okay. So we know that the steepest descent does some you know some job. Um, you know, does a reasonable good job, but it's not a fast algorithm because what happens is if you start, let's say the minimum is here, right? And then you have this level sets, which is hard to plot, but it, as you can see, what's happening is you start with some initial, you know, some, let's say the level set is like this, right? So what happens if you start with x naught, with x naught, you go in the direction of the gradient, you know, decre decreasing, so opposite to the gradient, until you get to another point x1, then you go x2, and then you go x3, and then you go x4, okay? So it's a zigzag type, and in fact, it's you, you take, uh, you know, you get orthogonal directions every time you um, you do the iteration. Okay, so not um, very fast in general, right? Now there are cases when, if you if you're lucky to pick an initial condition, right, and uh, if the system looks also is is, is kind of special, then you could. Um, probably get to the to the optimal solution okay in reasonable time okay but there's this method called conjugate gradients Which basically is, is going to uh, end up saying, when I'm at a point, you know, at the current point, xk, I'm not going to take the gradient direction. I'm going to take some, some combination, some linear combination between a gradient and what's called a conjugate direction. Okay, so let's first talk about, uh, briefly talk about um, conjugate uh, direction for a matrix A, which is symmetric and positive definite. Of course, sometimes you write this as, as A strictly positive, but it means that it's positive definite, okay? So as a matrix, it's positive definite. Recall, what does it mean, uh, positive definite? It means that, let me use P, transpose P is positive for any direction that's not zero, any, any non-zero direction, right? Okay, so you have in mind your, your like like a symmetric positive definite matrix, right? Well, here's here's the idea. The idea is that so this is a fact, and it's actually I'll, I'll try to explain it, but it, it's it takes a little bit more than to kind of fully understand it. But there are so if A is N dimensional, there exist N uh, distinct directions P 
P1P2 Pn which not only are this thing but they're linearly independent so these vectors think of them as vectors there are there are n linearly independent vectors so it's a basis for Rn which form a basis for Rn so they're linearly independent right there are no one is a linear combination of the others okay and there are exactly n so it's a basis with the following property such that p k transpose a p j equals zero for k different than j maybe I should say vectors if you like okay and of course PK transpose APK is positive I mean that's that's not uh, anything new because that's true for any any vectors right but the important thing is that you, if you if you make this product that you get zero when you have two you know you take two different like p1 and p2 okay now just think a little bit if a were just the identity so if we didn't see a here it would be just the identity then what's this re relation saying If you multiply this row with this column, right, and you get zero, it means that, at least in 3D, for instance, perpendicular, right? The inner, the dot product in R3, inner product in Rn is zero. So basically, if you just had the identity, this would be, this statement would say that there is an orthogonal basis in Rn. Okay? How do we know that? I mean, is there only one, or, or there are lots of them, right? So in R3, just think of R3, you just need basically three, I mean, a, a triplet of orthogonal, mutual orthogonal vectors, right? We're not even saying the, the, the length, so they could be different lengths. Lots of them, right? In fact, if you remember from Lean Algebra, you, how, do you actually how do you construct an orth orthogonal basis? Graham Schmidt. You basically start with with any basis and then you orth orthogonalize okay so you can actually create an orthogonal, orthogonal basis and of course you can create lots of orthogonal bases for Rn okay? now what's the thing about having an A that's, that may not be the identity well in linear algebra you also talk about Uh, possibly different types of inner product spaces. So Rn can be equipped with a non standard inner product. So, not the standard inner product would be like the dot product, you just multiply on, on entries, right? Well, here it would be the inner product between two vectors, x and y, is really y transpose a x. Okay? And, I mean, I don't want to go too much into this, but what makes this thing an inner product? If it's, if it's linear in x, and it's linear in x, right? As, as well as in y, we're, we're talking about real real vector, real, real spaces, so linear means you also multiply by a constant and that constant comes out um, so let me just list it here, so is linear 
in both uh, components and also the inner product of a vector with itself is, po is positive and is zero only for x equals zero. So that's what defines an inner product. Okay? Now so again if, if A were the identity this would be the standard inner product. But let's say we have a matrix that's symmetric and positive definite, right? Positive definite is exactly this condition, right? That X transpose AX is positive, strictly positive for any, anything that's x that's not zero. So now we have this inner product space, and, and there is a Gram-Smith orthogonalization in any inner product space, not just in the standard inner product space. Okay? So, in other words, you can actually start with any basis of R n. Start, start with the usual basis of R n, and using this kind of skewed inner product you can orthogonalize that and making into a basis that's orthogonal in this new inner product space so then p1 p2 pn would be a basis orthogonal in this Sometimes there, you put like a subscript here and say this is this comes from the matrix A. So the matrix A is where you start. You start with the matrix A, right? Okay, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, it's basically a Gram-Smith orthogonalization with respect to the center product. Okay, and how do you do this in practice? It can be ridiculously hard, right? Um, Kind of to, to write the formulas, but it's not. I mean, there's you can actually look at the Grand Smith organization and just use that those uh, same formulas, and you kind of iterative, iteratively can construct the you know p1, p2, pn, and that's not done in in a unique fashion. Let me just show you, for example, let's take this matrix. Is this uh, symmetric? Is this um, Uh, it's positive definite. You can check. Okay. So I'm going to skip that step. So let's let's write basically two such. I mean, we just need two vectors, right? Well, if you if you just try the standard basis, you'll see that this is not. I mean, these two vectors are not orthogonal. Uh, in this inner product space. Okay. But let's say we want to we want to start with um, let's say P1 is 1, 1. That's kind of the thing. You can the first vector you can just pick at random. I mean, then the second vector is going to be sort of constructed to be ortho orthogonal with respect to this inner product on the first one and so forth. So what we need is P2 so such that this is the case, right? Or actually let me P1 is the same thing because A is symmetric. Okay? Uh, I just I just wrote the same thing. P1 transpose P2. Okay? So we just we just do it. We say one one, uh, negative one, negative one, two. One, one is on this side, right? And I want x, y. So let's see, we get one, negative one, zero. Negative one plus two, one. x, y equals zero. Sorry for this. So y equals zero, right? So what's, what's p2 then? anything 
on x and 0 for y. Okay? So these two vectors, they are orthogonal in this, in this skewed inner product. Okay? They're not orthogonal in the, in the, in the standard. Okay? So, exactly. So that's, that's what the counterintuitive, it's pretty counterintuitive. So basically it says that these two directions are orthogonal and they form a basis of R of R two, right? And with this property, okay. well, that defines conjugate directions. So P one and P two are called conjugate directions. You know, with respect to for the matrix A, okay? but they're by far the only directions. As I said, you can pick any, any, and you start with any vector, and it could be Rn, right? Then what's the procedure of finding a conjugate uh, directions? Well, just complete that vector to a basis in Rn, arbitrarily, right? Then orthogonalize it. Then use Gram-Smith you're going to get one uh, set of conjugate directions. Okay? So, so that's kind of the that's kind of the definition of conjug conjugate directions. Now let's see where where do you actually use this? Where are these where are these useful? And here's the first I mean, they call it a lemma here, so let me or four. It says let P one PN be a set of conjugate directions with respect to to um, well just for A. And consider the following thing X one any vec any any point. So now we're kind of uh, kind of doing this construction of uh, the conjugate uh, gradient. And G1, which is a vector, so the first, the first direction we go is in the direction like opposite to the gradient of that quadratic form, okay? Step two, though, is the following. It says for k greater than one, you do the following. You go the next point x k plus one is x k plus t k p k. So you're going in the direction of the kth direction of the, of the kth conjugate direction. Okay? And yeah, it's, the question is why. So, let's just, let's just stick with this for now. Wait a minute, there's only n? There's only n, exactly. There's only n of them. So this is only going to go n, n, n steps. Each, you're going to pick the next the conjugate direction. And how? Such that...
So where TK is minus, and again there's a typo here, GK transpose PK over PK transpose APK. Okay, and we'll try to justify this a little bit later. And now is the is now is the departure from the uh, the the gradient fr from the steepest descent. G k plus one is the gradient of G at the new point. It's not the opposite gradient. But keep in mind, this is not the direction we're going to take next. The direction we're going to take next is this prescribed conjugate direction. Okay? So this is sort of like an auxiliary quantity which just goes into this, how far do we go in the new conjugate direction. Okay? Now, that's it. That's it. You'll say, well, okay, so whoever designed this must have been very smart, and I, I totally agree with that. Because um, you must have a reason. There must be a reason why to, to do this procedure, right? Well, and here's the reason. First of all, since G is quadratic, so I remind you in X, so this is g of x is 1 half x transpose ax minus b transpose x plus c. Then the gradient, and this is again, uh, the book is a little bit fuzzy, but again, if we, we're going to agree what? That the g's are also columns. So the gradients are columns. Right? Because then I transpose and I multiply with, I, I transpose g and I multiply with P, and I get a number, right? As well as this is a number. So T is a number. Yeah? Well, so if I write the gradient as a, as a column, we said is AX minus B, right? So let's just look at what the gradient is going to look like when we know xk, we know this is a xk plus 1 minus b, and we know xk is, k plus 1 is xk plus tk pk. Okay, so this is a xk minus b plus tk a pk, and this is just gk plus tk a pk. So, because G is quadratic, to advance G, we don't have to take the gradient at the new point. We could just take the previous gradient and add this quantity. Okay? Hmm? This, except the first one, which was opposite to the gradient of the initial point. Right? All the all the new G, the GK is always the gradient at the new point we, we're at. Okay. But anyway, there is this relation which kind of gives you the new G instead of the old G by just adding this this quantity. Right. Okay. So let's go back here. So so again, this is what you'll see in the book is that this is the same as GK plus T K A P K. And again, all these things are, are done because uh, having in mind, you know, how is a computer going to update these things? And you see that it's much easier to update it if you know the previous G. And you just update it like that, right? Rather than multiplying A times this minus B, it's a much it's just a times one of the conjugate directions. Okay, so that's that's uh, okay. 
Well, here's a here's a, a sort of kind of started this lemma here, but never never ended, finished it. So this this kind of funny construction, which only goes n steps. So uh, through this construction. G, J plus one. Transpose again. There's a. There's. I mean, it's not a. It's not that it's a typo in the book. It's just when you when you, and it, if G is a column and P is a column, you don't really want to put G times P unless you put an inner product. Right. So I want to stick with the matrix notation. So since G is a column, I want to transpose it so I multiply by P. And this is true for all four, k equals 1, 2, j. So what is this saying? This is saying that if I have the p1, p2, p3, p4, and I compute the g5, it's going to be orthogonal to those first four uh, conjugate directions. But orthogonal in the standard inner product. It's just there's no A in between, okay? Proof. What's the proof here? Well, proof really goes by um, <clears throat> by induction. And I don't, let's see, I don't want to get to the end today, so um, would it be okay for me to kind of, by induction after J. So what it's saying is basically um, show that it's true for G2, for instance. So see how G2 is computed from G1, and then apply G2 transpose to P1. And you're going to get zero. And basically, that's where you're going to see why this T was, was chosen this way. Okay? So, in a way, this T is chosen so that every time, every, the next G you're going to compute is going to be orthogonal, standard orthogonal, to the previous uh, conjugate directions. So that's 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 why this how this P, uh, T is chosen. So this is this is a desire, this is one thing that we kind of like to have. Okay. So I'm going to refer to you know the proof on page 121, 122. Um, as a consequence of this. G n plus one. So you start with G one, and then you go n steps because that's how many conjugate directions you have. Then the n plus one one is going to be equal to. It's going to be orthogonal to all conjugate directions, and. Conjugate directions, all conjugate directions form a basis in Rn. So how can you have a vector orthogonal to a basis, to all elements of a basis? The vector has to be zero, because there's, there's no more dimensions, right? So what does it mean? It means that after n steps, iterations, of this algorithm, g n plus one, which was the gradient of the x n plus one point, is zero. You found a solution. Because we said it's unique. That's beautiful because it 
it only takes n iterations to find the solution a inverse x, b, a inverse b. So you've I mean, you don't invert the matrix in n iterations, but in n iterations you go from any point you pick initially to the solution, to the optimal solution. Is okay? it possible that you'll get there before n iterations? It is possible that you get it before, yes. Yes, thank you, and I should have said that. Uh, so you do this as long as... Let's see. If G K is not zero, sorry, G G K is not zero. Because if G K is zero, then you basically you 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 stop you stop. This this wouldn't advance, right? Yeah. But yeah, it, it is possible to go uh, in shorter. But you know, n steps for an n by n matrix, huh? It's uh, it's uh, okay. So it's a beautiful thing. Instead of the steepest descent would take you 30, and you would you may never get to the point. You may get very close, but never get to the optimal point, right? Okay. So that's. But it only works for quadratics, right? It only works for quadratics. Yes. But I mean, even for quadratics, the steepest descent doesn't take you to the to the target, and you know may may take you for uh, infinitely many times. Okay, so now there is, that's pretty much the essence of this, of this uh, algorithm. The only thing that it's kind of up in the air is how do we, how do we know conjugate directions? And the beauty of this algorithm is that you can actually um, compute the, the, the new uh, conjugate directions as you iterate this, so you can you can you don't have to know a priori the uh, conjugate directions like we said in this result. You can just start with p1, and then do x x2 g2 right, and then this formula that I'm going to write here is is saying. Um, how to compute P2. So it's sort of Gram-Smith Gram orthogonalization embedded in this algorithm. And look at this. So what it's saying is P1 is going to be the one you start with. So it's minus G1. So it's just the gradient of G at the initial point. And then for k greater than 1, pk plus 1 is minus gk plus 1, so you use this gk plus 1 plus some scalar, some number times pk, where, you know, this number basically it's like the, the uh, roll of t, how, how much you go in that direction, right? Um, has has many forms, um, and is chosen such that the g in the direction x k. plus 1 is minimum possible. Okay. Now, when you actually uh, replace xk plus 1 with what it was xk and so forth, and you do like what we did um, already, you will see the following. One formula that transpires is, the fo is this. GK plus 1 transposed APK, PK transposed. I mean, there's no way you're going to say, oh, yeah, of course. You know, that's one formula. This is called 
has tennis stifle. Now, in the case of quadratic, and we're, talk, we're talking only about quadratic forms, there is also a better way. It's, a, it's, a, it's, the, same, it's the same expression, but this is called Fletcher Reeves. They're the same numbers, okay? And it's a good exercise to kind of go from one to the other. Extra credit homework. Show the two expressions are the same. What's the advantage of this second one, form, from an algorithmic point of view? You've, you've already computed gk plus 1, so you're just computing the length squared and the previous square divide, and you found beta, and then you go back and you find the new pk plus 1. So this, this is an amazing statement. Well, the statement, I didn't make it yet. Um, that this thing is going to give you a conjugate direction to all the previous ones. So it's going to give you... So this new P is going to be orthogonal to P1, P2, P3, up to PK. So this is so PK plus one is conjugate to P one PK. I mean I'm not gonna have time to to show that, but that's actually when you take, you know, PK plus one transpose A PK. Yeah? And you kind of plug in this um, formula and you use basically how G was computed, then you can show that those are conjugate to each other. So what's the, so bottom line here is the as you advance in your iteration, you're actually generating conjugate directions for the for the metric saying. At the same time as uh, after n steps, getting the actual optimum, right? Now it's not clear that you're actually decreasing the every time you go in the conjugate direction, right? But what's 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 clear from this formula is what that this is the direction you go next, right? It's a linear combination of, of the gradient, in fact, opposite gradient. So you are going a little bit in that direction, right? But possibly kind of drifted by the conjugate direction, right? So you're not going in the, this is not the steepest descent, okay? You're not going the steepest descent, you're kind of going off by, by this much, okay? All right, I'll leave it here, and I'll just um, so that's the algorithm, okay? And I'll just um, open this uh, conjugate gradient code, which I have to admit I just type it now, now while while you um, you do the exam, so. I hope it's working. I made it. I mean, I kind of get a, a test, but um, let's go here. And I don't know why I'm getting this. Let me just. 
desktop again. Hopefully it's quick. Um, so again, the implementation is, is basically because of the, the way it's kind of set up using this uh, formula. It's relatively easy. Yeah. I forgot how to do this, so I'll have to go up, back, and forth. Open. So the example here is the following: it is taking this three by three matrix, So example, A is this three by three matrix, which is three. Zero. I could just one zero four two one two three, which doesn't is not too clear that this is. I mean, it is clear that it's symmetric, but it's not clear it's positive or definite, right? Well, let's say it's, uh, you know, we check this. I mean, we find the, we find the uh, eigenvalues, and they're all positive. Okay. So, <clears throat> and we'd like to solve a x equals b, meaning we want to invert this and multiply by b, right? But we want to do this with the method of conjugate uh, gradients. So, I define the matrix A. I define the matrix B. And just look look how it follows. I can start anywhere. So I can start at 0, 0, right? The, very f the first time I go is, I hope this is not a mistake, should be negative the gradient. So it should be a minus. No, but the way the way it is, it should be. Is that? Yeah, no. So let me let me double check. Um, G is the negative, so this should be a negative. Okay. And P is. P is negative G. Well, because G, we, we want to continue and, and write that G, G n plus one. G, we want to we want to use this in a in a loop. Okay. So here's the loop. Now I'll tell you why I'm still need to use this uh, norm. Norm is the length of a vector. Okay, to be greater than epsilon. So because of the numerical errors, you cannot just say while well, the norm is zero is not zero. Excuse me because it will never stop. But, you know, we put a really small uh, thing there, and really this is going to stop after three, three iterations. So let's see. We, we start with t, and this should be right. Okay? And I use the, the transpose where I, where I have to, right? So all of these are transpose. Then I update x, going in the direction of p, current p. Yeah? Then I update G by just this easy formula, right? Okay, and I'm done. All I need to do is I have to find beta, so that's the square of the norm of, of new G over the square of the norm of the previous G. And then P is going to be minus, minus G plus beta times the previous p, because you know p is the one that's being updated here. And we can plot this, the, that, that uh, line segment. And of course, in the loop, we have to kind of call the, you know, now the current x is the current p and the current g. Okay? And then the counters are just uh, to count. That's the end. And, of, and at the end, uh, I want to verify that indeed is, is like that. So let's run this. 
Actually, it worked with the with that mistake. So, I know it doesn't work with this. So, that's funny. Okay, so that's. So it did, it did work with a minus. <laughs> I have to figure out why, but so just take a look here. It's kind of you start at zero zero, and you go one two, bang. Okay, that's it. Um. What happens if you don't have quadratic expressions? Then you're not going to get to the optimal, right? If you have, but if it's convex, if you have a convex function, you're still going to have one minimum, right? And there is actually there are results saying that this conjugate direct, uh, method is actually faster than the steepest descent method, and it leads you to um, uh, you know fewer fewer uh, iterations to get within a certain um, distance from the optimal. So you're saying it still will work for an arbitrary function? For a convex function. A convex function. For a convex function, yeah. It'll for a strictly get, convex function. It'll just get you close. It will get it. Cl it will. It will converge. So there, there is a result saying that it, it does converge, okay? And it actually converges faster than the steepest descent, which also converges. Now, just, just to kind of, if I have a com, strictly convex function, I have a unique minimum, right? Then the Hessian at that minimum is positive definite. So you can actually, um, I mean, it's, hard, it's, it's a stretch, but you can kind of imagine using that uh, as the matrix A, okay, and and using the conjugate directions for that matrix A for the Hessian at the minimum, which is positive definite and symmetric, and use that result to get a convergence. But you don't know what that matrix is until you found the minimum. Uh, correct, but I'm saying, I mean, uh, theoretically, that's that's the. Um, uh, that's sort of what takes. Uh, that's what replaces the knowing just that it's quadratic. So it's sort of approximating that convex function at a minimum with the uh, with the Hessian, and the Hessian stays positive definite in a, in a neighborhood. So you can actually, as you as you proceed in this algorithm, again, this is just sort of a stretch of imagination. As you proceed in this algorithm, as you get close in the region where the Hessians are all positive, definite, and symmetric, um, then this, this algorithm is going to advance you know, to give, give you to a minimum of that, of that uh, original problem. It sounds like what you're doing is approximating the function in the vicinity of the minimum by a quadratic. Exactly. Yeah. But again, this, you know, So after three iterations, you get x3. Well, x3, we use x3 here, is 1, 0, 0 is the optimal. I mean, is the solution, basically, of that linear system. I didn't show you, but that's what it is. Um, yeah, 1, 0, 0. And the error is 10 to negative 15. So this is really just a numerical error, a numerical um, error. But it's, it's, it is an exact thing in this case. Okay. So let me just stop and say the homework number six, which is going to be due Wednesday. Uh, what's Wednesday? The first? Second. Second. Um, is going to. I'm going to give you these two problems, numbers 8 and 9, uh, page 134, chapter 4, okay? And maybe also, 
10, 10, uh, let's say 10, 3. This is a two-dimensional one. And I'm going to have maybe one or two more problems on Monday. But uh, the, point, the point is that Monday we're going to start the chapter 5, which is um, going to be sort of the continuous version of this. So it's, it's sort of the calculus of variations uh, part of this course. And that's going to be basically the last two weeks of the, of the course. So it's, it's, it's worth actually trying that code on this thing. Five and six. One chapter a week. Is there a final going to be Q and A or will it be five? It's probably going to be five and six.